Have you been searching for your purpose? Have you lost hope? Well, I've got some great news for you. Hope is here. Hope is right now. And it's waiting for you. This is Tony McGee, Senior Pastor of Zion Hope Church. And I'd like to thank you for taking time to listen to this word from the Lord. My prayer is that this message will inspire and uplift you today. And I pray that this message will bring you hope. Remember hope. God's hands on people everywhere. And his hands are on you.
praise the Lord, everybody. How many of you know that his name is above all names? And that he's worthy to be praised. Come on, y'all. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so.
I'm kind of like just full from, from, from that. It's good to know that he's on my side. Man, there was a time when I used to be his enemy. Because I hadn't accepted his free gift of salvation through Jesus Christ. I was his enemy. Now I'm his, I'm his friend. That's good news. Amen. I want to mention a couple of things while I try to settle down. Um, I'm just an ops surveyor. And so I'm really grateful to see Dr. Langston back in the choir stand. Um, I want to uh, just, I don't know how many guests we have, but thank God for you being here. Um, last first Sunday, I was um, worship leading, so I'm up here and I can kind of survey things. And then when I serve doing the Lord's Supper, I kind of see people. Uh, and I feel like a proud papa when I see uh, our young adults who have graduated college, yet they still come to church. I see that. I'm a proud papa when I see those who are still in college and when they get a chance, they come to church. I'm a proud papa when I see those young adults that are going to be going to college or trade school or wherever, they still come to church. And that's a testimony uh, and a testament to, the, to their upbringing and what the hope is trying to instill in our young people. Yes. Yes. Amen. Amen. We just, every, Saturday, every Sunday morning, you cut on the news and it's at least two, three shootings. At least three, two shootings every Sunday morning. So I'm just grateful to see our young adults. And believe me, parents, and young adults, it's going to pay off. It will pay off in the long run. So I'm going to say these famous words of preachers. I'm not going to hold you long. <laughs> so um, let's go to um, 2 Samuel. Chapter 12, verse 20. 2 Samuel, chapter 12, verse 20. If you can, and it's our custom here to stand doing the reading uh, from the pulpit of his word. Second Samuel chapter 12, verse 20. I'll be reading from the NIV version. I'm almost done, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> then David got up from the ground after he had washed, put on lotions, and changed his clothes. He went up into the house of the Lord and worshiped. He then went to his own house and at his request, they served him food and he ate. Amen. Amen. From that verse, I want to talk about uh, we fall down, but we get up. We fall down, but we get up. When you think about the life of it, one of two events probably come to your mind. The first event is when David slew a giant called Goliath. The second event is when David committed adultery 
with Bathsheba. These are two monumental events. The first one, David reveals facts about his humility. The second one, David reveals facts about his humanity. The first one, David proves he was a man of faith. The second one, David proves he was a man of the flesh. When David met a giant named Goliath, that was a tremendous, tremendous feat by David. David had, the pri- David had the privilege, we had the privilege, to witness this great victory of David when David met Goliath. Wow, I'm chilling. <laughs> we also meet David when he met Goliath, Bathsheba. We are forced to watch the greatest defeat in his life. Until now, David had never lost a battle. David had a covering and anointing over his life. Wherever David went in the war of campaign, he always came out victorious. David had a special covering and anointing on his life. I bet you guys thought I was going to do a solo, didn't you? (laughs) God had David covered. This mighty man of God is going to allow us, if just for a few moments, to peek our head into his skeleton This closet of skeletons. But we don't want to stay there long because we've got our own bones shaking and our own skeletons. But in Romans 15, the Bible tells us that the Old Testament is there for us to learn from it. So we're going to learn a little few things about David and how he got caught up and what he got caught up. Anybody at any given time can fall. I say anybody. It doesn't matter if you're a preacher. Uh, uh, It doesn't matter if you're a servant leader. It doesn't matter where you work, what you drive, how much you own. Anybody can fall at any given time. And one of the worst things we can say to ourselves is what we're not going to do. Every time I've said that, I've opened the door to be proven wrong. We all are subject to fall. But what amazes me is that when a man of God falls, the first place it hits is social media. But what I discovered is that there are two groups of people who when a man of God or woman of God fall that exists. Spiritual and unspiritual. In Galatians 6 and 1, the Bible says, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye, you, doesn't say everybody, because everybody ain't spiritual. You who are spiritual, gently lift that brother, that sister back up. Because it could be you. Because everybody's subject to fall. So I know where a person stands 
when they get some gossip or something happens to a brother or sister in Christ and they want to keep perpetuating it and keep putting it out there. And let me give you an example. Uh, did you hear what Brother Turner did? I just can't believe it. I think I, I'm going to have to tweak this because I just, it just, I just can't understand what he did, why he did it. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We're all flesh. Our best is as filthy rags before holy God. If we were that good, Jesus wouldn't have had to come. He wouldn't have had to suffer. He wouldn't have had to die. But I'm glad that he did. Because my best is like filthy rags. In the Old Testament, we can find Noah who fell down drunk and embarrassed his family and brought shame to him. But Noah got up. Abraham lied not once but twice that his wife was his sister. He fell down as a liar, but he got up and God kept his covenant promise with him. Moses fell down as a murderer. He murdered an Egyptian, buried him, and thought he had got away with it. Moved to another state, if you will. But it was exposed. He fell down as a murderer. But he got back up. Saul, before his name was changed to Paul, not only did he fall down, he was knocked down for persecuting the church. But he got back up. And God used him in a mighty, mighty way. In fact, to write most of the New Testament and to become the apostle of us. He fell down, but he got back up. Peter, the very darkest time in Jesus' ministry, Peter denied Jesus, not once, not twice, but three times. Peter fell down in disgrace, but he got back up. And he preached the first sermon, and over 5,000 were saved. Amen. Thomas, doubting Thomas, didn't believe the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In fact, he said, if I can't put my finger in his holes in his hand and put my hand in his side, I ain't going to believe. He fell down in doubt, but he got back up, and the Lord used him in a mighty way. David, David, has had a real bad fall. As I look at verse 11, the Bible says that David was chilling out at the crib. His army was off to battle, but he decided to stay behind. So as I look at David, I can see that David is out of position. And we talk about our young people getting into so much trouble and so much thing, so many things going on in school. I can't help but wonder, is there a parent out of position? I can't help but wonder if there's a dad that should be leading his family, but he's out of position. A mom who thinks her daughter is her best friend instead of training her up and leading her, wants to club with her. I just wonder if a parent is out of position. David 
is out of position. David has too much time on his hands. And I've shared with some of you before how it's hard for me to relax and take a day off work because I got too much time on my hands. It's not good for me to have too much time on my hands. Let me tell you what happens when I have too much time on my hands. One of the bad things I do is go shopping. I go shopping at, let's say I go shopping at Lowe's. I'll buy something I don't even know how to use and bring it home and wonder why I got it. I got too much time on my hands. I'll go shopping for some clothes, bring them home. And my wife said, you might as well get ready to take that back. <laughs> uh, I'm out of my routine. I got too much time on my hands. Well, she'll call me and say, what you doing? Well, I'm at the Mercedes lot. <laughs> she'll say, oh, Lord. Uh, I got too much time on my hands. This is a true saying that idle time is the devil's workshop. David, from his rooftop position, sees a very beautiful Bathsheba. David's out of position. Ladies, my sisters, be careful what you expose and who you expose it to whether intentionally or unintentionally, unintentionally. Be careful what you expose and who you expose it to. You could be drawing unintentional, unwanted attention. The very thing that drew me to my wife was what I couldn't see. Her modesty. That's what drew me to her, is what I couldn't see. Not what she was showing me, what I couldn't see. Fast forward 41 years later, I'm still looking. Because I'm admiring what I don't see. It's her modesty. There's still some men who are looking for some modest sisters. They're out there. Be careful what you expose, and who you expose it to. Bathsheba's bathing. I don't know if they had invented curtains back then or not. But David's at a high place. He can look down and see what's happening. David made up his mind right then and there. I don't care who she is, who she belongs to. Not only is David now out of position, but he's now getting ready to be out of control. David quickly forgets who he is, who he serves, supposed to live. David takes on a spirit of entitlement. He thinks he can have whatever he wants, who he wants, whenever he wants it. We always want something we shouldn't have. That's just how that works. I was shopping a week or so ago, and I made up my mind for the 50th time, I'm going to eat better, exercise, and be more fit. So I could be fit for the kingdom. I could be fit to be used around here at Zion Hope. I could be fit for my family. So I was off this day. I go shopping. I go in, I get some apples, bananas, some spring mix. I'm going to make me some salads. Get a rotisserie chicken. I'm doing my thing because I'm serious about what I'm going to do. Then all of a sudden, as I'm pushing my cart, this force this, this starts dragging me over to the bakery section. I don't know where that came. It just... It was just pulling me, me in the car. I get over there, I start circling this table of donuts. <laughs> we always want what we shouldn't have. I had made up my mind, 
I was going to start eating healthier. I started circling the donuts. I started having conversations. Because <laughs> it's talking to me, and I'm talking to the Lord, and it's a battle going on. It's boxed up real pretty. Looks real good. I grabbed a box of donuts, put it in my car, and I continued to shop. I'll leave you right there with that one. <laughs> we always want something that we shouldn't have. And the enemy, the devil knows what you like. He knows how you like it. He knows how to package it up. All he wants to do is just put that thought in your mind. It's up to you whether or not you run with it. But we've got to be sensitive to that. David, who's king over all Israel, David's made up his mind that uh, the law of God don't matter to me. This is what I want. This is what I'm going. I'm king. I can do what I want to do. Unfortunately, there's a lot of folks in the ministry, in leadership, that take that same mindset. And what they do is they cripple, to some extent, the body of Christ. When, when leaders and, and people in leadership start taking what they want, they're not satisfied. David wasn't satisfied with what God already given him. He wanted more. His lusting for something that doesn't belong to him, he's lusting for something that doesn't belong to him, and it's taking him down a deceptive, deepening, and devastating path. David is out of control. David has his way with Bathsheba. She becomes pregnant. Now sin has taken David further than he wanted to go. He's out of control. Not only is he out of position and he's out of control, David is running out of time. David, because of the news that Bathsheba sent him, he's got to swing into crisis mode. That's where unchecked sin will take you. It will take you to a crisis mode. And you'll wonder how you got there. David, because of the pregnancy of Bathsheba, really, according to Levitical law, they both could be stoned to death. But David ain't worried about that because David's the king. But they sure could take Bathsheba out and stone her to death. David's worried about Bathsheba being stoned to death, carrying his child, but he's also worried about his image. He's in crisis mode. David is trying to save his face and at the same time. Y'all fill in the blank on that one. You can't do both. Let me put it like this. David is trying to save his face, and his donkey at the same time. Yeah, watch out, Doc. Watch out. Make it play. Had David repented right then and there, he could have avoided a lot of headache, heartache, and pain. The same can be said for us. If we would just stop and remember who we are and whose we are. David, for whatever reason, thought God that was taking a nap or something. God has an all-seeing eye. God don't sleep nor slumber. God knows what you're thinking before you think it. He knows what you're going to do before you do it. But God is being patient with David. 
But God's patience is about to run out. God is being patient with us. But his patience won't last forever. David tried to legitimize his sin by setting up Uriah as the father of Bathsheba's child. He's spiraling out of control and he's running out of time. Everything David tried to do, every scheme he tried to manipulate, it didn't work. Now, I ain't going to ask y'all to raise y'all hands. I'll raise mine. I've had situations where I've tried to manip manipulate the circumstances, tried to slide my way out, tried to ease my way out, try to scheme my way out. Everything I tried failed. Everything David tried failed. David tried to get Uriah drunk, hoping he would go home and, and be with his wife. That didn't work. David tried again to convince him to go home to be with his wife so David could save face and his donkey. It didn't work. Isn't it amazing how we, as children of God, when we try to scheme and manipulate how it fails time and time again? Like, for instance, I've had to deal with ill-gotten gains. I ain't going to tell you the story on that, but ill-gotten gains. You know what ill-gotten gains come to? Nothing. It don't make no difference how much money you come across, what kind of material things you have. It ain't going to come to nothing because of ill-gotten gains. God was trying to tell David something, but David wasn't listening. So when I watch the news sometimes, there's certain reporters I just don't, I don't know what it is, I just don't want to listen to them. So I'll take the remote and I hit mute until they're done talking and I'll unmute it. Well, we do the same thing with God. When we want to do what we want to do, we put God on mute. And hope he didn't see us do it. <laughs> then, when it don't work out for us, we'll unmute him because we want him to hear us. <laughs> it's the truth. So, David has put God on mute trying to work out this scheme so he can get Bathsheba's husband to take ownership of the child that belongs to him. Ain't that something? Not only did sin take him further than he wanted to go, now it's keeping him longer than he wanted to stay. That's what sin would do for you. We can choose whatever sin we want to choose. However we want to do it, where we want to do it with. We can choose it. We have the, the power of choice. But God has the choice of consequences. God reserves the consequences. We can pick whatever sin we want. But when it comes down to the consequences, we've got no control over that. God will choose the consequences, and there will be consequences. David is running out of time. Finally has Uriah killed because he sees no other way out. He puts him on the front line knowing that he would be killed. David, God lets David know that his time is up. God is, he's done with it. God has been patient with David up until this point. David is not listening to God. 
So God commissions his prophet, Naaman, Nathan, to expose David to the reality that God knows what he did. Up until this point, God had been patient with David. God had covered David. God had anointed David. God had, God had given David one blessing after another, one victory after another, after another. And then David started walking away from God because he wanted to do what he wanted to do. God said, okay, I'm done. God takes the covering off of David and exposes him. But he exposes him out of love. And because God loves us, if we don't adhere to him, he'll expose us. He'll take the covering off so you can really know that he knows what's going on. He goes to the prophet. The prophet gives him this parable about a rich man who was trying to impress a traveler Instead of the rich man using his own sheep or goat to prepare a meal for this traveler, he takes it from the poor man. He takes that animal whom the poor, poor family loved like one of their own, slaughters it for the traveler. David said, what do you think ought to happen to that guy? I mean, the prophet said, what do you think ought to happen to that guy? David said, I think he ought to be killed. He ought to pay it back four times, five times over. I think he should be killed. The prophet said, you that man. It's at that point that David realizes that God knows what he did. It took God to expose him before David could wake up and realize what he had did. And what David had did was sinned against God. We've got to stop calling sins, oops, my bag, uh, it was lax in judgment, uh, my fault. No. Sin is sin. And sin is against God. If David had repented, God still would have punished him, but not to the degree that he got punished. Because of what David did to Uriah, God took the child that him and Bathsheba had conceived through that adulterous affair. David lays out for days, fasting and praying hoping he could change God's mind. And sometimes our sins will be so heavy on us that it ought to drive us beyond our knees and on our faces before God. Sometimes our sins will cause so much havoc, so much chaos, so much confusion that it ought to drive us to our face before God. But if your heart don't reach the floor first, you're just taking a nap. Because it's with the heart is where the issues lie. If my heart don't hit the floor before my body does, I'm just stretching out. David had a remedy for what he did. But it's at this point David realizes this, that sin has cost him more than he was willing to pay. Let me tell you the, the remedy for David. When he came to his senses, when he realized that God knew what exactly he did, David said in Psalm 51, have mercy on me, O God. 
according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me of my sins. He wasn't talking to God while he was going through that mess. When he was exposed, he realized he had to get back to God. David said, create in me a clean heart. David said, I don't, I don't want you to make me over. I don't want you to patch me up. I recognize you as the ultimate creator. I want you to create in me, oh God, a clean heart. And restore the joy of the salvation. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. A good question to ask as I get ready to close. A good question to ask is the sin, is the pleasure of the sin worth the consequences of the pain? Or is the pleasure of the sin worth the agony of the pain? That's a good question to ask. When sin comes knocking on our door, and it will, is the pleasure worth the price? That's what we need to ask ourselves. I can answer it for you, but I'm not you. You have to make up your own mind on that. So I'm going to share with you this story that I've shared before. Uh, you guys probably don't remember it anyway. When I was in elementary school, I was on the track team, and we were at the t Tech High School at the district track meet. We had a really fast relay team, four by one. I was the lead runner. My cousin, who's also Thomas, was the anchor. I was arguably the second fastest in the school, but he was no doubt the fastest in the school. So I was the first leg. He was the last leg. I take off. I get us a lead. I hand the baton off to the second leg. He takes off. We got this thing going on. We got this covered. We're going to qualify for the finals. The second leg comes around, passes off the baton to the third leg. For whatever reason, the third leg runner falls down. He fell down, and it seemed like he was down forever. He fell down, but he didn't stay down. He got up. And when he got up, he didn't give up. He got up and started running towards the anchor. We were behind by then by two other teams, but he managed to get the baton into the hands of our anchor. Our anchor was the strongest and the fastest runner on the team. Our anchor caught up with the rest of the crowd and we got the victory. We got the victory because the third leg of the relay team fell down, but he didn't stay down. He got up, and he didn't give up. He put the baton in the hand of the anchor. That's my word to somebody today. Even when you do fall down, and you will, get up. Put your situation into the hands of your anchor, which is Jesus Christ. And he will lead you to victory. Jesus is our anchor. Jesus is the reason we can get up. Jesus didn't fall down. He came down through 40 and two generations. He didn't fall down in the Garden of Gethsemane. He went down on his knees so we could get up. And when he went down, he said, Father, 
as he finished his prayer, not my will, but thine will be done. He went down so we could get up. They didn't place him on a cross. He freely laid down on a cross. He laid down so we could get up. He was wounded and bruised, spit on, talked about. He took it all so we could get up. They laid him in a borrowed tomb. He laid there so we could get up. And when he got up, he got up with all power in heaven and earth. He got up so we could get up. Whenever you find yourself down, don't give up. Just get up and put the situation in the hands of our anchor, which is Jesus Christ. I guarantee you, you'll have the victory. Amen? Amen. Amen. Do you want a church that's exciting? Do you want a church that's relevant? Do you want a church that's filled with love? Come to the hope so you can learn and grow. I would like to invite you and your entire family to worship with us at Zion Hope Church. We're located at 5950 East 46th Street, Indianapolis, Indiana. That's at 46th and Arlington, right behind the Shell gas station. Hope is here. Hope is right now. And there's hope for you. Connect with us on the web at zionhopechurch.org or on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram for social media. We would love to see you at The Hope.